Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, and we are wrapping up the Book of Judges today. We have one more story about a Levite, and that's kind of all the introduction this story needs or could possibly have. <laughs> um, it's it's one you might not have heard in Sunday school, but it is in the Bible. <laughs> So what's going on here? <laughs> well, again, this is one of two stories, a pair that go together, that finally answer for us the question, what, what's with this cycle of apostasy, repentance, apostasy? Why? why how did we get here? How did we get here? Why couldn't... If, if you've There's read the water Judges, at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, you, you want to know, why can't we break through this? Why is this so repetitive? Even though some of these stories are, are, are fun and, as you say, material for Sunday school lessons and kids really like them. You're, sooner or later, if you're serious, you're left with the question, well, why is this? Is this just the way life is? Uh, covenant living always ends in failure and God's people never get anywhere and the enemy always wins and sin is stronger than all of our grace. Or is there something else going on? And so at the end, having got our attention, the writer, whoever he may be, is telling us two stories about Levites. They're kind of generic Levites, although at least, of course, they had real historical existence. One of them, we get the name of right at the end, and the name adds punch to the story. The second if you one, haven't we, listened yet to our episode on that story, go back listen yeah, to you the last episode listen. we released. Um, the second one, we're never told. Uh, and, and and so these are, in a sense, generalizations, but since God makes them, they are valid generalizations. And they tell us what was going wrong. The other thing <clears throat> we have to remember is that these stories are actually said at the beginning of the book of Judges. Although they come at the end, the historical markers say, we're going back to the beginning and showing you what has been going wrong from the start. And we'll, we'll note some of those markers as we go along in this particular story. Uh, it begins with the familiar refrain, there was no king in Israel. And this is not a political statement. This is a theological statement. God's people were not submitting to their covenant king, to Jehovah, to Yahweh. They were, they were doing whatever they wanted to do. And that's kind of the lead into well, why is that? Weren't people calling them on the carpet? Weren't people instructing them? Wasn't there, were there ecclesiastical and civil consequences for doing whatever you wanted? And the answer is, no, not really. Uh, we're going to see some civil consequences, some military consequences at the end of the story. And even then, Hosea has an interesting note about the whole event. We'll look at that toward the end. Anyway, we're back to Levites. And this one, again, is sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim. So Ephraim gets highlighted yet again, the tribe that cannot be reconciled, that always wants to be in the lead. Not that they are doing anything particularly here, but that it's just the spotlight goes over there. And out of this comes this this uh, Levite who took himself a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem had played a role in the last story, too. It's not a particularly great role. Uh, we're told that this uh, Levite had a concubine. We need to remember what a concubine is, because I don't know about you. Growing up, I was told it meant a mistress, which is yeah, not Yeah, that's what, it, what I was told. Yeah, it's, that's not what it means. It means she's an unendowered wife. Uh, now, sometimes men took concubines or even second wives in addition, in addition to their first wife. The crime is bigamy. It's having more than one wife. But as you read through the Old Testament, sometimes the words wife and concubine are used interchangeably. What concubine mean is, means is that she came into the marriage without a dowry. She didn't have any money. She may even have been the, the Levite here may have given the bride price to the father, and the father kept it. So she is in some levels like a slave or servant in that she has no capital of her own. Of course, by that standard, a lot of American wives are exactly the same position, having no leverage, mm -hmm. no education, no money, nothing in their own name. Maybe they have a wedding ring they could hawk if they had to. So, Which is she, why, this is my little soapbox about <laughs> why it's not insane to think about six months of income going to a wedding ring. Uh, no, it is not insane <laughs> at all. And it's also why men should, as they are able, buy jewelry for their wives and a life insurance policy and a few other things. 
uh, and why women should be educated and have the ability to provide for themselves. Because in this world, nothing is certain. Husbands die. Disease, murder, more. And men are unfaithful. And women are sometimes left high and dry with nobody to fall back on. So, yeah, concubines. Not And, and, and the Bible presents, and this would be a, a discussion in itself, but the Mosaic Law, one of the first things that Moses does in the Book of the Covenant, the case laws that follow the Ten Commandments, is to discuss concubinage and to spell out the rights that a concubine, an unendowered wife, has. Uh, and they're significant. Mm -hmm. uh, she is not just a slave who can be bossed around, even if she does not have the full um, capacities and resources uh, of a married woman. But also, since the concubinage thing is wrapped up in the sabbatical laws, and that's the context, uh, we take it that in the New Covenant, this particular position has passed away. Paul, on, Paul and Peter go out of their way to point out that Christian women are the daughters of Sarah, a free woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian wives are free women. They're not to be concubines and husbands are not to treat them as such. Anyway, <clears throat> having said that. That is actually important for this whole discussion that follows. <laughs> well, you know, it is. His concubine played the whore against him. I, I looked at that phrase because someone suggested it doesn't necessarily mean what it sounds like. And as I read through the commentators, quite a few said, well, this could just mean. But as I read the reasoning, the reasoning was sort of made up. The, the Hebrew mm -hmm. word, when every time it's used in scripture, does mean commit adultery. Uh, so I think the, the attempt, I, I think... Is a is from these commentators is a misunderstanding of the whole passage and a misunderstanding of the gospel. Because here we have uh, a representative of God and this and this this Levite, this representative of God, this pastor, his wife commits adultery. Now there is that moralistic thing within us that says, well, good for her, good riddance, let her go. Consider the matter Grounds final. for divorce. Grounds for divorce, grounds for education for execution. Mm -hmm. And um, and obviously, there's no taking her back. And I actually read that. And there was one commentary who said, well, the Mosaic Law would actually forbid her from going back. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. There's nothing <laughs> in the Mosaic Law that says that. Uh, it does say that if she gets, if you divorce her and she gets married to someone else, then she can't come mm -hmm. back. But even God overrides right. that one with respect to his covenant relationship with Israel. I believe it was in, was in Isaiah, or I don't remember. So I, I, I think there's an attempt to tone down what's happening in order to guard the Levite, which is probably the last thing we need to do in this chapter because that God's not guarding him. God's putting all these sins out there in the open. Anyhow, um, she, she apparently commits adultery and goes away to her father's house and everyone jumps on her father for taking her in, but it is a very human thing to do. And since we don't know all of the circumstances, we should be careful about being hypercritical here. Uh, women didn't can just go out and get jobs and start over renting someplace. That was it was not that culture. The alternative. Where else is she going to go? Yeah, she probably. She's would, unendowered. Like, she's unendowered. She, no she, she ended up being a prostitute otherwise. Um, so I, I don't think we can be critical of the father at that level at any rate. And then some people have criticized her father. Well, look what kind of daughter he raised. I'm sorry, fathers have no control over what kind of daughters they raise. The question is, have you taught? Have you explained? Have you loved? Have you disciplined? Have you admonished? Have you pointed to Jesus? But in the end, it's not the father can't be held responsible if his daughter fails in marriage. So again, there's, there's a lot of um, among these, uh, and I, I'm thinking here of Bible Hub, which I still think is an excellent resource. But every now and then you hit a passage where I think the pastors, the commentators have not thought well through what they're doing. They take it in bits and pieces with some assumptions in the back of their heads that would, could stand some scrutiny. So she goes back to her dad's house. And the King James says was there four whole months. The margin says a year and four months. The reason is because of a rather odd expression in Hebrew. And, then, and I watched the commentators fight this one back and forth, and I'm in no position to judge. But it's the Hebrew says she, would, uh, she was there days, comma four months, that is used elsewhere as um, a year, days. If you've gotten mm. days, it was a, a whole year, and then four months. So that's possible. Yeah, or just maybe four months. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. Because whatever it is, 
the, the husband's going to go looking for. If it's a four months, what's with that? Why is that? Why does it take so long for him to realize, oh, maybe I should go find her? If it's a year and four months, it's ridiculous. Um, but anyway, at some point. Would he be maybe waiting to see if she's pregnant? Oh, I hadn't even thought of that one. Yeah, maybe so. Um, her husband. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just processing that now. No, no, none of the commentators even brought that up. So, you know, I'm a guy. But they're all male. Room. Yeah, exactly. That's a bye. Okay. Her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. He's about transportation. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. I don't know if that means meet for the first time or just to see him. And his father-in-law, the father's damsel, retained him, and he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodge there. You know, so far, this is a soap opera. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a typical uh, primetime romance. There's nothing much going on here. We're kind of saying, what? And it's about to get worse. It's more boring. Came to pass on the fourth day when they arose in the morning, that he arose up to depart, that is the Levite. And the damsel's father said unto the son in law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterwards go you where. And they sat down and did eat and drink both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, the father in law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. And he arose early in the morning, the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Come for thine heart, I pray thee. And they carried until afternoon, and they did eat both of them. Notice both of them. Notice who's being left out of this whole, this whole last few verses. The girl's not there. Where is she? What's, what's with this? Where, why isn't she? Why isn't he spending time with her and rebuilding the relationship? Why is it all with dad? It's a little off. And this whole delay thing. What's this about? Why? Yeah, you know, we we probably have all visited relatives, and they and they press upon us to stay stay one more day, stay a few more hours, stay for supper. That's human, but it just keeps going and going. And again, this is the Bible. This is the Word of God. Where is spiritual truth here? I know. Again, it just seems kind of dull and pointless. Well, they did eat both of them. When the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine. Oh, there she is. And his servant, who's been left out, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here, and thine heart may be merry. And tomorrow get you early on your way that thou mayest go home. So one more time, it's just dragging out. And we there's something in us just on a literary level that says, Come on, we, something's got to be going on, and this is in that, and we're bored. Can something happen? And and emotionally, we're saying, you, you need to get home. The whole thing was to rescue your wife and bring her back and establish a relationship, show her you love her. It doesn't seem to be happening. True, there's lots that we're not told, but it's not being highlighted for sure. But the man would not tarry that night. He finally makes a decision. And he rose up and departed and came over against Jabus, which is Jerusalem. At that point, Jabus was still a Canaanite city controlled by the Jebusites. Uh, David had not taken the city yet because David isn't born yet. And there were with him two asses saddled, and his concubine also was with him. And when they were come by Jabus, the day was far spent, and his servant said to his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. Now, in the ancient world, uh, Ramada inns and, and holiday inns and all that were not a thing. The only hotel-like things, the only inn-like things generally were brothels. And you could go in and stay on the lower floor, get some food and sleep on the floor with everybody else by the fire. <clears throat> or you could use the services of other things available elsewhere. Mostly good civilized people hoped that someone would invite them in for the night. Hospitality was a highly praised virtue. We did a, a podcast on hospitality quite a while ago in the book mm -hmm. of Genesis. Yeah. And so... They, Back in Abraham. Yeah. Um, so they kind of were looking for something along those lines. And his master said, and we will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger, that is, someone outside the covenant. It's not of the children of Israel. We'll pass over to Gibeah, which belongs to uh, the tribe of Benjamin. 
And he said unto his servant, Come and let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. Ramah, that's where Rachel's tomb was, not far from Bethlehem. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. The sun setting is rather ominous here. Night is coming. And they turned aside thither to go in and lodge in Gibeah. And when they <coughs> went in, he sat him down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took him into his house to lodging. Now, again, to us in the 21st century, that of course not. Why would there be? No, in that <laughs> world, you, you, if you stood there and looked lonely and lost, someone would come up and say, hey, do you have a place to stay? <laughs> it reminds me places. of Paddington. Yes. He goes to the train station expecting to be taken up as a lost child. And yes. <laughs> stranger danger. Don't look at the strange bear. <laughs> you can't just take a random bear home. <laughs> Not random. My name is Paddington. No, they gave him that name, didn't they? Um, what was his real name? Is that ever revealed? Anyway. Uh, yeah, on. it was in bear language, though. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Um, so no one, no one takes them in. Behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim. Oh, so there is a good guy from Ephraim, or is there? He sojourned in Gibeah and put the men of uh, put the men of the place of Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, "Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou?" He said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim, from then Sami. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. And there's no man that receiveth me to house, but you know, there's straw and provender for our asses, and there's bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid, for the young man that's with thy servants. There's no want of anything. The old man said, Peace be with thee. Shalom. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie on me, only lodge not in the street. Um, this sounds odd familiar. Note. So he brought him into his house and gave provender to the asses, and they washed their feet and eaten drink. He is to this point a very good host, doing all the things that hospitality commands, although the city itself shows none. And mm -hmm. so, again, it doesn't mean anything to us, but in that world, it was huge. And also, we at this point, our sh memory should be stirring. Mm -hmm. Of another time that men came to a city and received no hospitality, and the one stranger within took them in late at night. And said, don't stay in the street. And said, don't stay in the street. So that's ticking away in the back. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, <clears throat> behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, the devil, me set the house round about, and beat at the door, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thy house that we may know him. And now the memories come back full like a flood. Yes, these are the exact words which, which the men of Sodom spoke to Lot concerning the angels. And the word no means to know sexually. In other words, we want to homosexually abuse your guest. Bring him out to us so we can do that. We're not told uh, that it was all of the men, although it's pretty, pretty uh, general statement, the men of the city. So this city has become a second Sodom, and we're playing out that scenario all over again. And of course, we, we're left with the question why. Now, there, there is something a little different. The angels in the story of Lot no doubt looked handsome and striking as angels are wont to do. But they just look like travelers. Uh, a Levite almost certainly would be dressed in a distinctive way to mark him out as a Levite, the way today many pastors were clerical callers or something, or rabbis in Jewish culture, and these are easily identified. It, it would be pretty easy to figure out this guy's a pastor, he's a teacher of the law. And so, in that sense, the offense is in some ways worse. The previous occasion is purely. Lust of the eyes turning into lust of the flesh. This is something else. Oh, a pastor? Let's have fun with him. Let's abuse him. Let's get a thrill uh, in the process. I keep thinking of Revelation where the angels of the seven churches are the pastors. Are the pastors, yeah. They're messengers. They're like mm -hmm. messengers mm -hmm. of the covenant. Some are spirit beings and some are humans. And the Bible does treat them more or less interchangeably in a lot of ways. 
in that what you're made of is not the point. Who you're speaking for is the point right. and who you represent. Yeah. Well, at so far, the man from Mount Ephraim, this old guy, seems like he's he's been a great host and he's he's has had foresight and he's taken in um, the Levite and his his party. But now something happens because sometimes you can take one virtue and you can idolize it. Our generation has done it with love. We we make love the most important thing in the world, but in the process we so transform it into something other than what God says it to be, that it becomes ugly and destructive. Uh, in our generation, it's come to mean accepting everybody just as they are, not wanting to change them and even supporting them and seeking government finance for whatever their perversities might be, because that's how you show love. In this case, the old man perverts hospitality. The man, the master of the house, went out unto them, and, and as Lot had before, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly. Same words that Lot used. Seeing that this man is coming to my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good to you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. Well, to protect your guests is one thing, but notice that the concubine just slipped off the list, the guest list. Uh, mm -hmm. She is now sacrificable, as is his own daughter. So again, he's taken this, this ideal of hospitality and, and pushed it to unbiblical lengths. Now, you can argue there's no way he could have stopped this, and maybe he's just trying to shame them, and it's a psychological moment. You can argue all sorts of things, but the simple fact is what happens is wicked. And the fact that he's doing it to protect a pastor does not justify it. And, it, and so far, the pastor's just standing there saying, huh? What? Oh. Hmm. By the way, the uh, the daughter vanishes from the storyline because in the long run, the man does not commit his daughter. And, uh, he just throws the concubine out there. And to this man do not so vile a thing. But the man, the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine. It's not clear which man because man at this point has been the host. But man has also been the way the Levites usually describe. So one or both of them. And it doesn't matter because if the, the old guy does it, the Levite should have stopped him. And standing by and watching it happen does not improve anything. So the man took his concubine and brought forth, brought her forth unto them, and they knew her, had sexual relations with her, and abused her all the night until morning. They did so in a very violent way. When the day began to spring, they let her go. How do we know it's violent? Because of this. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, finally she's released, and she has been badly, badly hurt, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was. Lord should be the protector and the savior till it was light. And we don't know what the Levite's been doing, but obviously looking out the window to see what's going on wasn't even on, on his radar, much less going out there and rescuing her or yielding himself as a sacrifice for her to release her. He's not doing any of that. He is protecting his own skin and basically has given her up, um, not only physically, but even emotionally and psychologically. He's Because he gets ready to leave. Her hands are on the threshold. And he said unto her, oh, and Lord, I'm sorry, I skipped over. The Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. He's not even going to go look for her. He does not know she's dead. Um, he's just going to get out of there while he can, and she can take her own chances. I mean, she was sexually faithless in the beginning. This is it. She's getting what she deserves. Apparently, he's leaving. Um, and so he goes his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, up and let us be going. What's, she, what's he think? She's taking a nap? Um, and the, the Hebrew is real short. I think it's two words. It's just kind of a barked, come, go, or something like that. But then answered, then the man took her up upon the ass, and the man rose up and got him to his place. And when he was come to his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. Take some money to pay for the messengers. 
And it was so that all that saw it said, There is no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt to this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. There well, is not precedent or warrant for cutting up dead bodies to no, my knowledge. No, <clears throat> there isn't at all. There's not. A body is to be treated. It's significant that it calls the body her, too. Oh, yeah. He took her up. Not yes. the husk that was once her. Yeah, not the corpse, not the remains, not the uh, chemical afterbirth. It's, um, you know, the Bible always assumes that the body is an integral part of the person so to the point that it can be called a person. Abraham buried Sarah. Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus, not some after remains of him. Because what looks forward to the doctrine of the resurrection? But yeah, there's no precedent for, of any sort. Now, in the book of Samuel, we have an occasion where Saul cuts up some oxen and sends them around. And, and of course, the message implied is, mm -hmm. if you do not submit to this challenge, to this call, then may this be done to you, or in this case, to your wives and daughters, in Saul's case, to your oxen. It, it, it kind of smells of the covenant formula of cutting up animals. Uh, to mm -hmm. to start a, a covenant, uh, but it is shocking, and and we can ask why he did it. He has evidence no serious love for this woman. We don't know why he went back after her because from the moment he gets there, he ignores her, and at the first opportunity to he needs to save his skin, he just throws her out. Does not try to rescue her. Does not try to protect her. Does not lay down her, his life for hers. Does not even go looking for her in the morning. You, know, you can you can accuse him of cowardice, but that doesn't mean in the morning when things had settled down, he couldn't at least go look for her. There's nothing here. He treats her with complete callousness. And one of the things in the story that really stands out, and, and more to me this time as I was reading it than it has in the past, is how devaluing their covenant with God devalued their view of women. Uh, the woman is pushed aside all the way through the story. We do not hear her speak. She does not have any kind of voice. She's ignored in the reconciliation process. She apparently is included somewhat in the celebration. She's part of they, apparently, who have a good time that night. Um, and then she's made into a sexual victim and target to save her husband's life and the life of the old man. And so what's, by the way, in passing, the old man, Mount Ephraim, doesn't come off so well after all anyway. So there's that. But this Levite, we look at this guy and say, this guy is a cad. He's a jerk. He's, he is a complete failure as a husband. And that's kind of the point. Remember, we're looking to see what went wrong in Israel. And one thing is becoming clear with the pastors. You saw in the previous story, pastors would sell out the worship of Jehovah and the purity of worship for money, even not very much money. And here we see that pastors will not love their wives sacrificially. If this had been Jesus, we know what Jesus would have done. He would have gone out there, and depending on whether he's in a state of exaltation or humiliation, he either would have laid down his life for his bride, or he would have blasted the people away. Um, this pastor sits back and cringes and protects himself. Uh, the pastor here completely fails to image Jesus in any way, with the result that here and in the story that follows, women continue to be treated very cheaply and unimportant because that's the precedent the pastors are setting. If a pastor will not value his own wife self-sacrificially, then what's the congregation going to do? And you may remember that the uh, qualifications for elders is that he be a one-woman man, be faithful to his own wife. That's the starting point, not a seminary degree, not mastery of the original languages, not even a thorough working knowledge of the Bible. But first of all, that relationship thing. Is he faithful to one woman, his wife, and does he have his children under biblical discipline? Does he love and, and admonish Kings too. them? Kings too. Yeah, you're not to multiply, to multiply wives yourself. Wives. Yeah. That's what the law required. That's not what's happening. Well, given our time constraints, I, I and, and that we've already seen the Levite pretty well, I want to kind of hustle through the rest of the thing, except for the one time when the Levite appears on camera again, because he shows up and then he goes away. We don't hear about him anymore. 
uh, the children of Israel, this is chapter 20 of Judges, uh, are gathered together to Mizpah, and um, they, everyone except the tribe of Benjamin, and they interrogate the Levite and say, how was this wickedness? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose up against me and beset the house round about me by night and thought to have slain me. And my concubine they have forced, raped, that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, you're all children of Israel. Give here your advice and consent. And then he, he goes off camera for the rest. Um, that wasn't exactly true, was it? What a strange description of events. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, that wasn't what happened. Um, they sought to kill me. Well, maybe, but they didn't say that. Like they, they said yeah. something very different. And it, it, he completely neglects his irresponsibilities, dereliction of duty throws it all upon these people. And, and again, we, we can ask, and I don't know the answer, what his motivations are. After he failed this, you know, most, most men would at least have the non-self-respect to cringe and crawl into a corner and pull it in after you and not tell anybody that this has happened. Why stir up an entire nation to avenge you of your loss when you didn't, that was a loss that you didn't even try to prevent yourself. And you ought, he doesn't love the woman. So is he just avenging his own self-perception of his honor? It's very weird. It's kind of a, a <laughs> well, it reminds me of uh, John Wick and the mindset of the son of the mob boss, not the actual mob boss who's actually <laughs> had to deal with people, but the son of the mob boss who thinks he's yeah. entitled to all this respect. Fortunately, I have seen John Wick. <laughs> 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 so that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. It's a good movie. Very, very, it's a uh, yeah, very bloody. It's, you killed my dog. That's the one, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I oh, okay. I honestly love it, if only for the fact that it's like the 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 audience reaction to it has been like. So why did you go off and do all this stuff and take down like an entire section of the mafia? Well, they killed my dog, and everyone goes, "Yeah, that makes sense." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go at it. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, but but if the if the comparison is accurate, it does not say much about this Levite. At least nothing good. Well, what happens here? Now, our first thought would be, all right, well, this guy is wicked and a jerk and a failure, but now he's called all of God's people in. Things will go better now because the covenant people will handle it well. We'll get some sort of justice, if not perfect justice. And the people agree they got to do something about it. So they swear an oath that no one's going home until this has been dealt with. And they cast lots as to which tribe should go up against the town of Gibeah because they've wrought folly in Israel. And um, the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe, uh, the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin saying, what is this wickedness that's done among you? Now, therefore, deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death. Put away the, the evil from Israel. Okay, that, that's pretty much the way things have done. That probably should have happened before they started doing war preparations. But war preparations take a while. So, okay, maybe this is okay. But asking the tribe of Benjamin to get its act together and set out, settle its internal affairs is more or less appropriate. It probably should have said, you know what to do. You go execute them. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's fudging the federal state line a little bit. <laughs> but it's 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 not it's not too bad. They realize this is a serious sin and crime and needs to be dealt with. Um, but the children of Benjamin would not hearken, and we're not told why. We're not told if it's because they could, did not consider this, you know, sinful. You're you're going after the gay lesbian community, and you just guys have a problem and an attitude. You don't know what you're talking about. Or was it more along the lines of, well, maybe something happened here and maybe it didn't, but you have no business telling us what to do with our internal affairs, so go take a leap. You don't know exactly. But it for could some be reason, corruption in the FBI, CIA. So yeah. We, we, we don't know why they, they refused, but they refused. 
And that's kind of gutsy of them because they're a they're a tribe. At this time, they were a fairly large tribe, but they didn't outnumber the rest of Israel. So it was, it's gutsy that they took a stand. Not in a good way. <laughs> Not in a good way. Children of Benjamin were numbered at that time of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword, besides the inhabitant of Gibeah. And they were um, they were experts with slings. Everyone could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. Uh, and the men of Israel, besides Benjamin, numbered four hundred thousand. So Israel outnumbered them by a lot. But they're sharpshooters. Yeah, but they're sharpshooters. The children of Israel arose and went to the house of God, and asked counsel of God and said, "Which of us should go up first? And God says, "Judah." You notice what they ask and what they don't ask. Who should go first? <laughs> well, that's that's a good question, but there's a question you really should ask first. A couple questions. Um, is this what we're supposed to be doing? Is this what we're supposed to be doing? Are we on your side? Are we in step with you? Uh, are there any sins in our midst before we go and fight a battle? Because when we fight battles and we're in sin, that doesn't go well. But they don't they don't think through that. It's just this sin is and, and oftentimes we as Christians are guilty of this. Mm -hmm. The sin of the world over there is so horrible and evil that we need to draw all of our attention there and focus on that and fire all phasers in that way. And we haven't stopped to ask ourselves, but is there not sin amongst us? Mm. And, the plank in the eye. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. God cares more about the sins of his people ultimately than about the sins of the world. He can deal with the sins of the world in their time. But he's in the process of sanctifying us. And if we get on our high horse and start attacking people who have done bad things, and yet we have done th bad things before his face, we may be way out of line. Uh, we should be aware of mass movements to accomplish important things. Not to say that there's never a place for them, but we should be careful as to how we get involved and be afraid of our own self-righteousness and spiritual pride in the midst of such things. Oftentimes, the leaders of those movements have a lot to hide, and by focusing attention on the evil out there, they draw it away from their own personal evil. Uh, so anyway, God simply says, Judah, without correcting, amplifying, warning, uh, in a sense, God has already withdrawn his grace from them, because at other times, God might say something like, um, hello, shouldn't you be asking something else? But he doesn't. He just, hey, that's... You want to know the answer? The answer is Judah. The kingly tribe, princely tribe, the tribe through which Messiah will come. Obviously, they should go first. <coughs> they probably could have figured that one out on their own had they thought about it. So the children of Israel um, rise up and, and attack Benjamin. And the Benjamites win. They destroyed of the Israelites that day 20 and 2,000 men. That's a lot. Men who are never going home to their wives and, and families again. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle in array. And um, the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, shall I go up um, to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? God said, go up against him. This, this question's, okay, they're asking a right question, but it's still not the question they should ask, which is, how are we standing with you, Lord? Why did you not give us victory? Why did you let the bad guys win? Why are so many people dead? Uh, they do ask the, shall we? Okay, that didn't go well. Should we stop? But not, why did that not work so well? And God simply says, go up against him. He's still, he is withholding grace and that he is not explaining this. And in other times and places, God will send prophets who will explain in no uncertain terms why you shouldn't be doing this. But this time, God's kind of holding his, his voice and letting them hang themselves. Children of Israel came again this, uh, against the children of Israel the second day. And again, the Benjamites destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel. 18,000 men. Well, it's not as bad this time. It's only 18,000. It's still horrible. We've lost 40,000 people at this point. <laughs> yeah. We can project... And eventually, we will reach a point where we will start gaining people. Yeah. Instead. That's what statistics has taught me. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> then all of the children of Israel and all the people went up and came into the house of God and wept. See, they got emotional before. 
They'd wept before, and God had not been impressed. And they sat before the Lord and fasted that day until even, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. No sin offerings. But they are with sacrificial blood seeking God's face. And when they have coming done these- Coming back to worship? They're coming back to worship, you know. Gospel worship, worship that emphasizes the blood of the Savior, the blood of the Lamb. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days. And there's our historical marker, mm -hmm. Phinehas. Phinehas appears in the book of Numbers. He's the one when the Midianites try to seduce the children of Israel, well, do seduce the children of Israel. And one of the one of the Seminac princes brings a a woman right past the tabernacle uh, to take her to his tent and commit fornication with her. Phineas is the guy who grabs the javelin, goes after them, and runs them both through. So he knew Moses. He was a very very younger contemporary of Moses, but he was he was a young man who was at least thirty uh, when Moses died. So we are way at the beginning of everything if he's still alive. And given his his stance for holiness, we, we can kind of wonder, what Phineas, what happened here? Well, very likely, knowing the way these things go, he got overruled. He may have had the spiritual insight to, to know what was going on, but he may not have the backing from the other tribes and the other leaders. But whatever the case, he's there. And um, they, Israel collectively, says, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my of Benjamin and my brother or cease? And God says, and the word is the Lord. Yahweh says, go, and I will deliver them into your hand. What follows is a plan. It's a plan that comes directly from the book of Joshua. Uh, let's put liars in wait out in the fields before light. And then we're going to go engage the people and draw them out of the city and when they're out, the liars in the wait are going to rise up and go into the city and take it and burn it with fire when the smoke goes up and realize we've got the city. And the guys inside will come out and the guys who are in the field or are running away will turn back and we'll catch them all in between the pincher and we'll kill them all. So there, just because God had said you're going to win, it doesn't provoke them to carelessness and let's just go out and hack and slay. It provokes them to strategy, I suppose Bunny would say. <laughs> uh, they actually think about it, and oddly enough, they find their answer in the Bible. The Bible isn't a textbook of, his, of uh, military tactics. Yeah, but it contains a few. <laughs> they decide to borrow one, and it works. Um, they they engage, and the Benjamites think that they're they're winning, and they pursue and move away from the city. Liars and wait, hasted and rushed upon Gibeah, and um, set the city on fire. And then the others turn, and when the flame began to arise up out of the city, with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended to heaven, I think Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed. They saw the evil was upon them, and they tried to run away into the wilderness, but by and large, didn't make it. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down, and there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men. And those that remained turned and fled into the wilderness into a huge rock called Rimmon. Um, and they killed 5,000 more men along the way. Um, and then 2,000. So that day, those of Benjamin who fell were 20 and 5,000. Only 600 survive and make it to the rock Rimmon and abode in the rock of Rimmon four months. Oh, wow. I just caught that. That's where mm. we started, wasn't it? Yeah. Four months. Four months being isolated from what was left of their families and such. Actually, nothing was left of their families, as we're about to see. The men of Israel turned against the cities and smote all the cities of Benjamin with the edge of the sword. They put them under the ban, basically, and they destroy everything. Um, man, woman, beast, everything they can find. It sets fire to their cities. So they've made themselves... Heathen, a heathen nation. They treated them as if they were a heathen nation, as yeah. if they had fallen into apostasy. The, the, it was the prescription that was given for cities that had apostatized to worship other gods. And they um, figured, and nobody seems to contradict them, that what they had done 
by siding with the sodomites and the murderers uh, and turning against lawful authority, both ecclesiastical and judicial, amounted to setting themselves outside, setting themselves outside the covenant as a heathen nation. And so they destroyed them. And that brings us to the last chapter of the book, which is a little, a little happier, and yet still we're going to be left with some, what? Because the elders of Israel are very upset. They had sworn an oath that they would not give any of their own daughters to the Benjamites, because, you know, heathen, complete separation. But now they realize they've destroyed an entire tribe, and now they're sad about that. They hadn't thought that out before. Um, they they build an altar, they offer burnt offerings and peace offerings, and they they start looking around for a way to find wives for the men that survived, the Benjamites who survived, so they need 500 of them. And their first thought was, well, we swore an oath up front that if anybody did not come and side with the, Lord's, with the Lord and fight the Lord's battles, that they would go under the battle. And it turns out that uh, Jabesh Gilead had sent nobody. So they send out a strike forth and take out Jabesh Gilead, and but save all of the uh, maidens. But that's still not enough. And so they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins that had no, not known man by lying with any. They brought them to Shiloh. But they're, they're still short. And they, the text says they repented them for Benjamin because that the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Yes, the Lord had. Um, I don't know. I would like to see a little more personal responsibility here. Uh, <laughs> we, we, you were the, you were the ones who killed them all. Um, and don't blame God for their sins. If you want to talk about Benjamin's sin before the face of God that brought this, that would be one thing. And our it's over, Benjamin that made the breach in a sense. <laughs> yeah, and our overwhelming zeal that we're now trying to repair. So kind of a confession after the fact that what we did wasn't exactly what should have been done. So yes, God's sovereignty doubtless overruled all of this. But I, I would, uh, yeah, it makes me a little uncomfortable. A lot of this is, a lot of this whole <laughs> chapter, in fact, all of the end of Judges and all, arguably all of Judges, you're constantly left with this, yes, but... Something doesn't feel right, which is often how you feel once you're involved in the uh, judiciary matters of any church. Like, ah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, the elders did the right thing, but yes, you repented, but yes, the people are are trying to receive you. In, but it's sin is a hard master. Sin is is destructive. Sin leaves its little burrs and cockles and seeds behind. And it's hard for any of us to ever say that we got it all right and that we fixed everything. If only we could fix all sin by throwing a ring into a volcano. You know, one decisive act that makes everything perfect. You know, one, kiss the princess and she wakes up and everything. So if that were, and of course, in a sense, that's what Jesus did. One decisive act that in the end does fix everything. But one well, of the messages here is we're not Jesus. And even in the example of the one ring, if you are at least taking the books into account, <laughs> there's still the scouring of the Shire. There's still mm -hmm. wickedness in the world. Yeah, there is. And Tolkien understood that only too well. Yeah, the mustard seed has to grow before the birds of the air can rest. <laughs> well, someone comes up with a brilliant idea. We can't give our daughters to these men because of the, er, the oath. But how about this? There's if we a... pretend we don't want to. <laughs> There's this feast in Shiloh, and it's accompanied by dancing. The young women come out and dance. One writer has argued that the, the words imply it's some kind of coming out uh, fertility announcement of, look at me, I'm ready to get married. That may or may not be so. I don't care. It still doesn't justify what happens. Well, But they're, they're ready to get married. Not like this. So these women, these young women are going to come out and they're going to dance and you guys sit along the parade ground lines and watch and see the one you want and go and grab her and run off with her and she can be your wife. So we're, we're legitimizing kidnapping here. And Tell again, about those sobbing women. Yeah. We're just, yeah. Yeah. Let's say by women. Apparently, no, I've never seen seven brides for seven brothers, but I've been told 
that in the story, the brothers justify it by an appeal to the Sabine women and to this story. Do you know about that? Yeah. I think I remember that. I don't know if they use this story from uh, from Judges, but they definitely he he's reading Plutarch. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> he's getting his book learning in, and uh, he says, "Well, we we need to just learn about this. We need to go down and you know kidnap those women, and uh, eventually they'll like you. You know, Stockholm yeah. syndrome." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's so they do. A, <laughs> uh, you know, Stockholm syndrome. I think that may be what we're dealing with here. <laughs> But when the fathers and the brothers come and say, you know, they 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 stole my daughter, we're going to say be favorable to them for our sakes because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war. For you did not give unto them this time that you should be guilty. And in, in the perception of the elders here, when the fathers and brothers come, their concern will be, well, if we let this go, we will have broken our oath. And of course, breaking an oath is capital offense. If not civilly, at least you can expect God to do something. And the elders kind of assume that that's going to be their only complaint, not she's my daughter. I did not give my consent. I love her. I'm supposed to protect her. And this guy stole her. I'm going to go at No, no, no. no. You, you kept your own. That's all that matters. Yeah, this is kind of Hammurabi, isn't it? It's like, well, you didn't fulfill your duty as a warrior of Israel. Therefore, your daughter has to pay the price by being yeah, kidnapped and apparently. forced into marriage. Um, the children of Israel did so, the children of Benjamin did so, and took with took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught. And they went and returned to their inheritances, repaired their cities and dwelt in them. And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and so on. And it ends, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, no kidding. There's also so all of these women are being treated as concubines now. Like we uh, know that women yeah, can inherit. Oh, good point. Yes, but, but women weren't supposed to marry outside of their tribe if they had an inheritance because that belonged to the family. There was something right. bigger than them that they belonged to. Yeah, and they're just I, like, oh no, I'm I'm sure all of these women have brothers who are inheriting, so they're they don't need anything. Yeah, and it's all about the brothers story. and the inheritance. They're not taking into account. Yeah, I'm just mad. Yeah, I am too. And you know, the first uh, there was the, the commentary. I will not, uh, out of courtesy, name the author, who because he he taught me a lot about judges and how it works and how to read it. When he got to this, he went real soft on these guys and tried to basically apologize for them and say, well, you know, the girls wanted to get married, and it's really kind of a sweet tale. The guys came down to it. What? No. 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 They wanted no. to go to prom at most, yeah. if yeah. if what you're saying about the dancing thing is true. Yeah, and that's, that's the most you get out of it. They still would have expected everything to be done in the right order, in the right way with their fathers and their brothers taking a part in the courtship. This, this, this is kidnapping, plain and simple, and the civil penalty for kidnapping was execution. Mm -hmm. There is no way this is right. But remember, we're, we're trying to find out why did things go so wrong generationally? From the beginning, and here we have the second part of our answer. The, the pastors, the Levites, uh, did not like, love their wives sacrificially, and they set a pattern for all the rest of Israel. It was okay to treat women as subhuman, show contempt toward them. You know, we go out of our way as Christians oftentimes to defend that the Bible has a very high view of women. And the Bible does. Mm -hmm. Israel didn't always. <laughs> and, you know, you get to the time of Jesus, the Pharisees did not treat women with respect. Uh, it is it is the Bible. It is Christianity that's elevated the role of women, or at least put it where God says it should be. But God's people have not always been there on that page. And here we have an example of a time when they most certainly were not. And the whole thing resonates with that. Every little thing, we see the women being disregarded, treating as, treated as property, assuming yeah, the women. Yeah, the women really want to be raped. Um, no, they don't. Now That's how that works. Yeah. Now the the thing to do here, as we close, I think, is Gibeah is mentioned. This whole battle in Gibeah is mentioned one other time in Scripture, and that's in the book of Hosea, appropriately enough, and in chapter uh, chapter. Is there another place? Oh, Isn't there may be. Saul from Gibeah. Am I misremembering? Yes. I think. <laughs> See, there's yes, this, I'm misremembering. There's there's no, there's this Gibeah and Gibeon, and I always get them confused. Saul is of Gibeah, yes. 
Um, and by the way, that um, the, the battle, the city is mentioned, the battle isn't, except here. But it does kind of explain why when, when Jabesh Gilead is in trouble, and this, of course, is like 300 years later, that Saul of Benjamin goes to rescue them. And that when Saul dies, it's the men of Jabesh Gilead who go and rescue Saul's remains and, and cremate them and hide them from the enemy. So but this is the point where a lot of the women who become the mothers of Benjamin were originally from Jabesh Gilead because of this whole thing. And there was something else. Oh, and, and when Saul is anointed or chosen, rather, and Tamil tells him, he says, why, why me? I am, I'm of no account in my house, and I'm of the smallest of the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, he's of the smallest of the tribes because his tribe was nearly wiped out. Mm -hmm. And it's had to go back to the beginning in terms of, of reproducing. So, yeah, the, the thing is in the background all the way through. But there is one more point where God makes uh, an actual comment on the battle. And it's, this is uh, Hosea 10. Verse 9, O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of Israel did not overtake them. In other words, your current spiritual problems, and this is at the end of Israel's history, just before the Assyrian invasions and the captivity. So the entire history of Israel can go back to the days of Gibeah, which again was right at the beginning, shortly after Moses' death. Uh, shortly after the conquest of the land. So this this sin has been at work from the beginning. And he mentions Gibeah because there's a chance when you, you had an opportunity to really seriously deal with sin, your own sin, not simply the sins of the city of Gibeah or the tribe of Benjamin. You had a chance to really look at sin and say, this is disgusting. This is horrible. It's an offense to God. It's going to bring God's judgment upon us. It's going to destroy our future, our children. <clears throat> we need to get right. And God says, and you didn't. The battle against the children of evil, children of iniquity, did not overtake you. The battle never caught up with you. You didn't understand the nature of the battle. You thought it was about punishing some of those by some of those guys over there. Yeah, that was that was part of it. That wasn't the whole thing. You needed everybody repentance. lost this battle. Everybody lost. You needed to repent and you didn't. You thought it was enough to deal with a few of the external things, and yes, it was costly. It still wasn't enough. And even that cost could have been avoided had you at the first gone to God and said, this is all of our faults. We've let this happen. We've let the nation deteriorate. And um, there are idols in all of our hearts and we need to repent. And they refused. It is ironic and appropriate that Hosea should be the one mm -hmm. to point this mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Because he is the anti-version of that Levite. He is the prophet to whom God says, go find this prostitute and marry her and be faithful to her. And he does. And then she has children, one by him, uh, clearly, but the other two seems maybe not. And then eventually she runs away from him and God says, go get her. Mm -hmm. And again, to look at the commentators, it, it is amazing how many say, and I'm not just talking about a few modern guys, I'm talking about the old time guys too. How many say, uh, yeah, that was, this is a vision. It's a parable. It didn't really happen because, first of all, God never asked his servants to do anything so disgusting. Like, what? Huh? Like eating human feces? <laughs> yeah. <like that. laughs> Walking naked through town for, yeah. Um, yeah. I, good omens. As I recall, Emily, you don't like good omens. But, oh, no, I like good omens. Oh, do. okay. I, don't, I just don't recommend it widely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't recommend it. I'm not recommending it now either. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a, there's a scene at the end where just before Armageddon is being averted mm -hmm. and um, one of the apparent representative spokesmen for God who remains behind the scenes says something like, well, God doesn't ask his servants to do anything that would be embarrassing or awkward. <laughs> and the resident demon Crowley says, Shh, he doesn't know God very well, does he? <laughs> that is a profound observation, actually. Uh, the authors are not Christians by any means. Uh, but yeah, he, it's amazing how many people say, well, either that would be immoral, therefore God did not do it, 
or that would bring discredit upon the prophet and his ministry, and therefore God would not do it. So it's it's a vision or a parable, not something that really actually happened. Uh, and what's going on there, of course, is is the same thing that, that well, what moralism always does. It feels it fails to look into the heart of God. Now, does God normally tell his pastors that they should go find prostitutes and marry them? Of course not. And they say, but yeah, that would be contrary to the holiness of God. You mean the God who repeatedly called back adulterous Israel to himself and in the end sent his son to win back an adulterous bride mm. by his own sacrificial death. That God? The same God who looks at your sins every single day and still loves you? Yeah. Yeah. They have trouble making that obvious connection. And sometimes I just wish I could, you know, pop back in a time bubble and say, before you write that. Have you considered <laughs> this? Uh, because it's it's in those little moralistic corners of our thinking and our application where we betray the gospel. We, I mean, I know most of these commentators that I read, you know, they're they're very godly men who, in other places, strongly defend the gospel of grace, justification by faith, substitutionary atonement, all that. But when it comes down to, but you got to be good. And good will be defined by our sensibilities and what we're used to in this Victorian era. They get a little weird. Mm. And they can't always see the simple reflection of, yeah, we're the, we're, it is I, O oh Lord. I am the man. I'm the one who's been faithless. I am the one for whom Jesus died. I am part of this bride that is apostatized. And you did come after me like Hosea went after Gomer. Not like the Levite who sat back and watched it all and washed his hands of it. So, application for our time and our age. And once again, we have no king in the United States. And that's not a comment about our relationship to the House of Hanover or Windsor or whatever it is these days. It's about our relationship to the God of Nations. If he is not our king, then we do whatever is right in our own eyes. And it doesn't play so well. Of course, even more abominable is when the church has no king. Mm-hmm. When we don't even, uh, well, you can, you, Jesus will save you. If you want to make him Lord of your life, that'd be great. But that's a separate transaction that happens later. Yeah, Jesus isn't king yet. He's our coming king. That is in the millennium, he'll be king and force people to obey him. But right now, again, we're back to, he's, he's Lord, if you make him Lord. And his law, yeah, that was for the Old Testament. If, Doesn't speak just, to civil, just a matter of legal process here if you make him lord where does his authority come from <laughs> yeah you you've kind of yeah, elected him john locke and voluntarism right the church is having a terrible time in our generation right now with recognizing that our first loyalty is to god and our and the, as i've seen it play out these last couple of years mostly the the obvious hallmark of this failure is the unwillingness of god's people to go to church Mm -hmm. and to use all kinds of excuses now that it may have been valid for a short time or not to stay away from the public assembly of God's people because it's not that important. It's not that necessary. I can watch it on TV, yada, yada, yada. If we can't get to the first thing of your king calls you into his presence one day a week and you're refusing to come, that sounds to me like there's no king in your life except your own passions and your own mm -hmm. soft laziness. And you can expect exactly what she deserves, and the, and the church can expect exactly what she deserves. Everyone's worrying about the expanding power of the state. It's it's a concern. But, you know, when the church does what it's supposed to do, it's not a concern. God can deal with that. God wants us to do what we're supposed to do. What we are supposed to do begins with faith in Christ and the worship of the triune God. Mm. And so, how are we different? Well, their judges weren't Jesus, our judges. So we're on the we're on the other side of the cross, and we don't have to keep reliving the cycle. But we need gospel preachers to call us back to reality. Mm -hmm. Right, and we have gone way over time because the story required it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that. I mean, there, there was there was no avoiding it. Um, so <laughs> if you have a rapid fire recommendation, please speak up. I'll start with Good Earth Tea, sweet and spicy. It's a classic. <laughs> Brian, you got anything? Actually, yes, uh, because I'm I'm planning to go watch this with uh, one of my pastors tomorrow, uh, along with my wife. The 2005 Chronicles of Narnia, Legend, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
Oh, uh, I recommend that. That's pretty good. Yeah. It is. It's a good movie and a, a, a fairly decent adaptation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the and same of course, could not be said all... of the sequels. <laughs> yeah. What sequels? No. Yeah. Oh, no sequels. yeah. They only made one movie. It was too yeah. bad. Every series has an episode or two that never really happened. <laughs> I still have not seen Prince Caspian. Yeah, that's keep, good. For the best. Yeah, yeah. And don't even think about seeing the Voyage of the Dawn Treader if you <laughs> it's But they pulled all the stories together with a common plot thread. Anyway. <laughs> exactly the thing they weren't <laughs> supposed to do. Uh, I'm going to recommend A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens because mm, it's that yay. time of year. And yeah. our school just did the play. Dickens was not a Christian. And obviously, there are heavy moralisms in, in the thing. But it's a question we can come and we can look at it and say, yeah, this is a lot like, like human sin, except you got the wrong answer. And as Christians, we can say, let me explain to you the right of children. What should this have said? What should our author have told us? What should these spirits be saying? But it is still a beautiful parable. It was aimed at social conditions in Dickens' time. It was not written just for fun. He would, he'd been planning to write uh, an essay on mm. uh, how the industrial age was abusing children and fomenting poverty and all that. It was a little bit of a Marxist twang, but not, not wholly without some justification. But he figured a story would do it best, and he was right. The story has endured, while all the other essays of that age have vanished. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting to look behind the scenes. Uh, I saw Patrick Stewart's version, which I kind of sort of half-heartedly recommend. He could have, if he had had more money, it would have been a better production. But it is fun to see Patrick Stewart going to church as the converted Scrooge Mm -hmm. and walking and the things things that, that people have not been to church in a long time. Oh, I'm supposed to take my hat off. Oh, I kind of remember this Christmas carol, but I don't know the words until someone holds up a hymn book and he's able to sing with them. Uh, just just little cute <laughs> touches. And of course, I love Patrick Stewart for other reasons. So I, I, I point out that it exists without wholly recommending it, although he does a um, reading of the book, uh, audio reading that I have on tape someplace, and it's really good. So there you go. Well, now that you've mentioned Christmas Carol, I'd be remiss if I didn't also say that the greatest adaptation you should all watch is A Muppet's Christmas the Muppets. Carol. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Except you watch the DVD it. version that cuts out Belle's song because you don't need it and it's stupid and it undermines her whole character. Oh, there is one that cuts her out? Good. Yeah, the DVD <laughs> release. They realized after they released the VHS, they were like, oh, no, we didn't need that. And so the next time they released it, when the DVDs came out, they cut it out. Okay, I am watching the I'm watching the DVD version with my kids. We haven't got to that part yet. Good. So make I sure it's be, not some I kind of special so extended thankful. edition. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I will be very thankful if that's cut out because it was horrible. Okay. Anyway, there we go. Merry On Christmas, everyone. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. You can send us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Rumble, and YouTube. See you next time. <laughs>